All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to Coronavirus and Our Mental Health. My name is Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Haleiwa on the North Shore. And it's a hot summer day. And I don't know about you, but we've got road work up here. So there's lots of noise and lots of stuff in the air. The good news is that uh, eventually the days are going to cool off. The trades are going to come up and refresh us. And the roads are going to be smooth for nice traveling. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the other good news is our coronavirus is doing well. It's slowly but surely coming down. And we're averaging now about 300 new cases every day. Now, if you compare that to where we were in May, which was about 600 new cases per day, we're doing well. We're about half that. And if you take a look at the spike in January, where we were over 4,000, we're less than one-tenth of what we were in January. Now, there's a but, of course. There's always a but. But if we go back to March, uh, where we were doing really, really well, we were averaging a little less than 50 cases per day. So we're still about six times higher than our low point for the year. So we've still got a way to go. Uh, the other good news is we're doing well on coronavirus. Uh, the variant uh, BA5 is still causing us problems, but we're slowly but surely working away at that. BA5 is causing, is so very infectious, it's causing most of our new cases, but we're, we're working at it hard. Uh, we still have a way to go. You have to remember with coronavirus, this is sort of like being on offense and defense. And the virus is always on offense and we're on defense. Uh, so it takes us a while to sort of learn how to stop that offense. And uh, we still need to work on our bringing our vaccines up to date, our boosters up to date, and to learn a lot more about BA5. But we're getting there. So that's positive. There's another but, and that is you have to be aware of the fact that our cases per day go up when there's a holiday, and we've got a big holiday coming up. Labor Day is just around the corner, so don't relax too much uh, and take care of yourself and be safe and make sure that your loved ones are safe as well. Now, because of all this, we've been focusing our recent shows on positivity because right now, we're surrounded by negativity, not only from the coronavirus, but from the mass shootings and from the war, uh, climate change. Every time we turn on the television or social media, there's something very negative that we have to deal with. Uh, so we've been focusing on the positive and we got a very positive show coming up today. There's one caveat that I need to give you before we start. And that is, we're not gonna give you platitudes on this show. We're not going to uh, come on and say, hey, everything's okay. You don't need to worry. Things are going to get better. Just relax. The future is bright, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and don't worry. Who, me? Don't worry. <laughs> I don't know how you feel when I'm down and I'm depressed and somebody comes up and says, hey, you know, let it go, you know, be happy, you know, just go out and uh, better times are coming. I don't know about you, but I get pissed off. They don't know about my problems. They don't know how it's affecting me. And it may be easy for them to be happy during this time, but it's not easy for me. And they don't seem to understand that. So like I said, the show is not gonna get platitudes. We don't have a surefire way of being positive and being happy. But what we are gonna do is we're gonna share some of the joy that people are finding during this sort of dark time sort of the wonder of things and the joy of things that are out there that we're missing if we get too caught up in all this negativity. And that's what we're gonna to do today. Uh, we're gonna to talk about the joy of art. And to do that, I have my good friend, Tamara Moan with me today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this and I hope Tamara is too. Welcome to the show, Tamara. Thank you. <laughs> now, Tamara is not only an artist, she's a writer, and she's a teacher, so she's got a lot to share. And I was thinking, Tamara, that maybe uh, at the beginning of the show, we could start off with a little bit sort of an overview of art, uh, the various forms, and maybe wind up with what I'm assuming is the part that you like the best, which is watercolors. Mm -hmm. So I've, um, of course, art 
encompasses an awful lot from performing arts and music to visual arts, which is what I do. Um, and pretty much since I came out of the womb, I've been doing something creative. Uh, I have always drawn and um, I gotten a lot of encouragement from my parents to do that throughout my childhood. And then I also, you know, went on to get an art degree. Um, and it wasn't until I was done with college that I really started painting more seriously. And um, the, um, you know, I've, I've taken classes in all kinds of media, oil painting and acrylics, et cetera. But um, <clears throat> I really got on the watercolor path when I took a painting trip with George Ballard, who's a teacher and artist here on Oahu. And I was prompted because of the, um, the joy of travel. I was looking forward to having this trip and it involved painting and um, the painting so entranced me that I've kept with it all these years. That was um, in the mid eighties that I went on that trip. Um, so watercolor is really a terrific, a, a, medium, especially if you're on the road because it's so portable and very, very easy to clean up. It's just water-based, um, but it allows me to e express a wide variety of things. Um, and I'll use it at all kinds of scales, small little pictures in my sketchbook to really large works that are multiple feet across or high. Uh, Tamara, tell me uh, the interesting thing about watercolors and what you're saying is that it sort of reminds me of music. Um, somebody, you know, when I was studying music uh, and I've studied the arts mostly because I'm not good at any of them and, uh, and I wanted to appreciate them. So I wanted to appreciate music. And somebody was telling me that Mozart, playing Mozart is one of the easiest things to uh, music to play on the piano. Mm. And then they followed it up with saying, and it's also probably the most difficult to do well. I and think I'm sort of, very, yeah. And I thought of that as with watercolors, I, like you say, it's easy, but it's got to be very difficult as well. At least that's what I understand. Is it that is. True? And a lot of people find it very, very challenging because um, it's unpredictable. It moves in its own way. And it's also very hard to cover up your mistakes. And so a lot of people just paint in one go. You just go from beginning to finish and that's it. You can't, it's very hard to go back in and correct something. Um, and it really has a mind of its own, but that, you know, that's part of the beauty of it too. It's very spontaneous. It really um, captures light well, which is another, you know, an element if you're a landscape painter or something, of course that's very ephemeral too. So you're sort of matching the elements with the media that you're working with. Um, and I think because it's, continues to be challenging. That's probably why a lot of artists stick with it too. They don't ever feel like they have complete mastery of it. And it, you know, it continues to be a challenge. When you talk about light, I'm fascinated with light for, for obvious, for many reasons, but uh, it brings me to color, uh -huh. you know, and how it changes the colors. And to me, I feel such a lifting, such a joy mm -hmm. when I see the colors in paintings and watercolors and that. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that joy of, of colors and how you, how you do that? It's way beyond anything <laughs> I can imagine. Um, well, with watercolor, you have the luminosity of the paper that you're painting on. That's really what makes it glow. And um, so it's learning how to, how to use the light in a way that's furthering that brightness and um, the, uh, saturation and luminosity of the color. Um, yeah, color is really, color is one of those changeable things that is around us all the time, but you don't realize really necessarily what the components are. Um, but of course we live in a place too with a lot of really bright sunshine, which makes the colors very intense and clear. Well, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I'm writing, and uh, I'll share with the audience that Tamara and I met through writing, uh, not through art, uh, because we're both writers. And uh, I would be writing something and uh, it just wasn't working, you know, like you're talking about painting. And I would just put it aside, you know, not throw it out. I'm, I'm you know, pretty anal, so I would hold it. <laughs> but, uh, and then other times I would be writing something that I hadn't really planned on. And all of a sudden, 
it opens up and comes to life. And I'm saying, whoa, I, I didn't realize I was getting here. And this is great. I mean, you have those experiences with your art? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think any kind of creative work has that. I mean, you have you have moments where it's just not coming together and you just have to either move through it or move on or let it rest. And then other times everything clicks and it just, you know, it's like magic on the page. Now, one of the things that I asked uh, Tamara to talk about was, in addition to, to painting for a long time, doing art, visual art, uh, she's also been teaching for quite a while. Uh, and I also do teaching and uh, teaching is, uh, it's a whole different ballgame because uh, we're focusing on helping other people with this joy. Um, and uh, it's wonderfully rewarding, but it's, it can be very difficult. And uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you manage to, to teach people to not only do art, but enjoy art. Um, teaching has been really rewarding for me. I started out teaching at Linicona, the school that's associated with the Honolulu School of I mean, the Honolulu Museum of Art. And um, I've taught all levels from preschool age kids to people in their 90s. Um, and what I've always enjoyed about it is the creative nature of teaching. You have to approach each student as new territory and fit what you're doing to what they are willing to receive. Um, and I find the biggest challenge with teaching adults is that you have to work at getting them to quiet the negative voices in their head. Those have really been ingrained over years and years and years and years. And especially with art, a lot of people had an experience as a kid where somebody told them, oh, that doesn't look good or you shouldn't try that. And it's just, that can be a deadening kind of message. Um, for the, during the pandemic, the, the challenge has been, how do you translate an in-person class into an online experience? And um, I was lucky enough to get um, chosen to be one of the teachers uh, for Adventist Health through Castle Hospital. Uh, they decided they needed to reach out to some of their people who weren't able to get out of the home very often. And they really felt some creative activity was beneficial for health. And so they started a series of online classes and they had three or four teachers doing that. And that really prompted me to learn how to do the online sharing. Um, another thing I did because my position at Linicona disappeared with Corona um, virus, they, um, the school completely shut down and they let go all of their faculty and um, so I was looking around for some income replacement too. So I ended up getting on the state teaching roster, which puts teachers into DOE classrooms. Um, and through that experience, I also, they gave me some um, helpful training on how to conduct online classes. And uh, at least it was, you know, it was a way to connect during a time when all of us were really limited in how we could get out and how we could be together. Um, now I'm really happy that we can be in person again. Um, it's just a completely different sort of um, animal. You know, when you're in a room together, you can draw on the energy of everybody and you can egg each other on and encourage each other in a way that's really a lot more difficult through Zoom when you're each plugged in individually. Um, there's something that happens in the room uh, when you're all together that can be really magical. Um, but I'm I'm really, I'm so, I feel really grateful that I still have the opportunity to share what I love doing with other people and help them find expression that way. That's terrific. And I, I have to share with the audience, uh, Tamara is uh, doing her classes now in a tent <laughs> outside in her yard, which is one of the most beautiful places on the island. It looks out at Kailua Beach and... Uh, uh, God, it's just wonderful out there. And that must be a great experience for you and the students to be out. Yeah, I've gotten community. a lot of positive feedback about the location. <laughs> <laughs> How is that teaching outside, though? That, that's that got its challenges, um, too, right? It's not too bad. The, I mean, the tent really keeps us dry. 
and uh, it gives us some shade and it's really nice to have the air moving around and you know the birds singing and stuff it's, it's not really too challenging unless it's quite windy so but we figure it out well that's great uh let me go back to one of your previous comments about uh when things get frustrating mm -hmm. and i know that uh you know it's difficult you know what whatever i'm doing i'm doing well and all of a sudden something goes wrong and it's very frustrating and i can't seem to know how to fix it uh, as a teacher how do you deal with the frustration sometimes that uh you know that get your students uh mm -hmm. and sort of stop that brush mid-air as they're trying to uh, think about what to do um one of the most useful tactics is just to change direction and completely divert onto another track and usually changing your um, attention to elsewhere can help break that log jam. Um, a lot of times if it's uh, if something isn't going right, you can figure out how to, I mean, a, a lot of, it doesn't matter if it's a class or not, in, in my individual work too, you'll come across something that's not working. And as my mother told me when I was a little girl, and I would be doing a drawing and suddenly there's like a big splot of ink on there. She'd say it's turned into a spider. <laughs> you just have to, you have to open up and allow yourself to see other possibilities in what's happening. And uh, it might not be what you originally env envisioned, but a lot of times it's even better. Well, that's terrific. <laughs> I, I'm thinking as you're talking, I'm thinking, well, you've got a subject in the middle and then you've got background and you've got, you know, all around. And when you switch that attention, that can really uh, open up things that you hadn't thought of before, I would imagine. Exactly, yeah. So it's, it's like you're looking at a picture and all of a sudden, instead of focusing on maybe the person that's in the middle, you're focusing on trees behind or the ocean coming in. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, maybe now is a good time to bring in that, since we've talked about art and teaching, let's, maybe we can bring in uh, writing. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, you know, I know you've been on various projects with writing, especially that uh, chat books that you've, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, Tamara gave me uh, one of hers, which was very nice. And, uh, you know, I have no talent as far as uh, art goes, a little talent as far as writing goes. And I've always thought if I could only draw the illustrations from my own work, you know, because <laughs> nobody else seems interested in writing. <laughs> and drawing stuff for my writing if i could do it you know that must be a great freeing experience and tell us a little bit about the interaction when you're actually writing and drawing in this on the same track is that uh -huh. that must be phenomenal um it is it is some really interesting cross pollination can happen and i actually uh used to teach a class and i i still may teach a class again called side by side which is visual work with written work and i used to teach it with a friend of mine who was also a visual artist and a writer and we would alternate activities writing visual writing visual and um it it brings you to a different places both with the writing and with the visual work and um what i did for these chapbooks that ken mentioned i had a bunch of poetry that um i had you know written over the span of about 10 or 15 years. And uh, during the pandemic, I had enough time to actually uh, take on this project, which I'd had in my head for quite a number of years. And so I organized the poetry into um, little collections that each had like a dozen to 20 poems. And then I made, um, I made each collection into a small book. And uh, although the book isn't illustrated per se, it does have a cover illustration and there was a lot of artistic consideration in terms of how the pages are laid out, etc. cetera. Um, and I don't know if this would be a good time to pull up my website, but there is a picture on there of the, so on the, if you see here, the, um, on the left side, there's a, a shot of four little books. So there was a, a wrapper that went around each volume and um, each volume had a different set of poems in it. Uh, so that was a really great, a great little project. It had a lot of um, handwork involved in the stitching and binding of each book. 
Um, another project that I did more recently was a collaboration with a friend of mine who's a printmaker and there were a whole um, group of us who were making handmade books and uh, the theme that we were trying to fulfill was um, in my neighborhood was the title. So it could be anything related to your neighborhood. And um, because my friend knew that I wrote and I also have a letterpress, which allows you to print writing. Um, we ended up making these little tiny books that each had a separate poem in them that related to the theme of in my neighborhood. So I printed the poems, we made them into a little sort of like a little folded origami thing that got inserted into this book and you opened the book and it was like a little magic box that unfolded. And this is um, the picture that's come up is the chat book that I mentioned earlier. These other um, poetry books, I don't think I have a photo of them on my website, but um, they were like little jewels. People really loved unfolding them and finding out what was inside. <laughs> so yeah, in that did. case, yeah, in that case, the imagery, um, my friend worked on the imagery and I wrote poems that were in response to the imagery. Uh, it was really nice um, partnership. Wow. You know, uh, and again, to, for the audience, uh, Tamara and I uh, often meet at the uh, Windward Community College for their writing retreat. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Lillian Cunningham, who runs that uh, and teaches that, uh, oftentimes gives us a prompt. Yeah. And in uh, some of the writing groups I'm in have a topic. And so uh, a lot of people write on the prompt in the writing retreat. And in my writing groups, people are writing on the same topic. How does that work when, you, when you're teaching uh, art, for instance? Do you ever give them a topic and have every, mm -hmm. every student that's with you on, to, to draw? And how does, that, how does that work with art? I know it works. It, it's interesting with writing. Yeah. Yeah, it's very similar. Um, for instance, I'm teaching a class right now that's a painting class, and we I'm I'm basing all of our work on the theme of place, like our place on the island, our place, physical place that we grew up in, um, or a favorite place that's special to us that we like to go to. So all the paintings are based around that. And yes, uh, just two days ago, the students started working on their bigger painting pieces. And so the location where we're painting happens to be right up against the Ko'olau Mountains. And several of the students um, chose that to paint, which they could do by direct observation. But several of the other people were um, painting a place that was important to them in their childhood. And um, so we were talking about what colors those places evoke, what emotions those places evoke, and how do you depict that as well as what the landscape, the physical landscape might look like. Um, so it's just, you know, it's an idea that's a starting point. And then with painting, a lot of times the painting itself will tell you what it wants to be about. And just like with a piece of writing, it might end up in a direction that's a surprise to you. You know that's, you know that brings up so many images and so many thoughts as we go along. Uh, the Koalows, um, you know, I live on the North Shore, but I make trips to down the Windward Coast many times, and just driving by the Koalows is an awe-inspiring experience. I yeah. look up at those green mountains, and I just, you know, it almost brings tears to my eyes. It's it's. There's such beauty in this island and all the islands yeah. in Hawaii. And I've been to all of them that I was allowed to go to. I haven't yeah. been to Niihau and Kohalawe, but uh, uh, the beauty is just around us. And, uh, uh, and to be able to, to uh, do it with art is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Tamara, we're running a little uh, short on time and I've been asking a lot of questions. Uh, I would like to turn this last couple of minutes over to you. And, Anything that you would like to add, something that, that struck you uh, with art uh, that you wanted to say, uh, you know, um, it would be a good time. Okay, the, uh, I, can, I can tell you that the last couple years has been especially challenging. I mean, like, like everybody else, I've had my challenges too, and art has really saved me, I feel. Um, and part of it is not only 
having the ability to continue to do creative work myself, but also the last couple of years I have done collaborative work much more than normal. And some of it has been mail art that I make something, I put it in the mail and send it to a friend of mine. They make something, send it back to me. Um, some of it has been work that has gotten traded back and forth between me and another artist friend. Um, some of it has just been checking in with my art friends and giving each other feedback. And those connections have just been so vital to me. Um, they were there before the pandemic and to a lesser degree, but all of us, all of the creative friends that I work with felt it was really essential that we crank it up and support each other in that way. And it really made me feel not so alone going through all this weirdness that we've had the last couple of years. Um, and I think a lot of us have realized how much our relationships mean to us. Um, and so it's been a nice melding of my relationships and the work that I find so gratifying and satisfying. Amrith, thank you for, for saying that because that's one of the things that I run into all the time with the coronavirus. Uh, with the coronavirus and the pandemic and the lockdowns and everything, people have felt so alone. And yeah. to counteract that is to reach out and make those connections and, and be part of that connecting. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's terrific. And thank you so much for, for being on the show. It's been a pleasure and I hope we can talk to you to coming back soon. Oh, it's been, it's been fun. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> And thanks to everybody here at Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks to Jay and Haley and Eric and Michael and everybody. And thanks to you all in the audience who joined us today. And uh, my wishes for you are the same as for everybody. Let's, uh, let's find our own path and find our own joy. And, uh, and thank goodness we're living in Hawaii. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.